So you wanna know how to bulletproof your knees and never get injured again. Well, this video today, this live show, I am gonna show you an advanced knee conditioning routine. We are slowly starting to move out of rehabilitation or the most basic conditioning phase and moving into advanced conditioning with this video. I'm also gonna reveal the biggest mistake that people make when doing these routines. So make sure you stick around right to the end so you learn that. All that and more coming up. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. In case we haven't met, my name's Rad Burmeister. I'm one of the co-founders of Unity Gym and the co-creators of the UMS, the Unified Movement System, formerly known as the FMS, where we teach you how to nourish and move instead of how to diet and exercise. And today I'm gonna to be going through an advanced knee conditioning routine. This routine, um, look, unfortunately, Yanni has been out of action this week. We're finishing off some renovations in the gym, which we're gonna to reveal to you guys when it's all done, hopefully in the next week or so. And uh, I've just told Yanni to put his head down and get it done because he's the renovations master. So I'm doing these shows on my own. And so Yanni is the one that normally does all of our thumbnails and everything. Unfortunately, we haven't had our stuff looking as good as it normally does. But nonetheless, if you look back over the last, uh, over um, it's Thursday in Australia now, so Monday and Tuesday's episode, we had the beginner and then intermediate routine. Now I'm going to take you through the advanced routine. So before I get started, I'm going to be, uh, hey, Bob. Ah, cool, man. Hey, Bob, how are you? Good to see you tuning in for the first time on the show. If anyone, for everyone else that's tuning in, please uh, let me know your name and where you're watching from. And any questions that you have about this routine, knee conditioning in general, or anything that I can answer for you, please put them in to the uh, comments box so that when I go get back from teaching you guys this routine, I've got some stuff to talk about with you and I can help answer your questions. So, you ready to go, Richie? All right, let's do it. So we're going to get out on the gym floor. I'm going to take you through this routine. And uh, yeah, you can hear those renovations going on right there. Um, so excuse that. I hope that's uh, not too distracting for you guys. I'll make sure that I talk up nice and loudly. So knee conditioning. If you haven't watched the series so far, the main three areas that you're looking at conditioning are the quadriceps, the calves, and the glutes, the hip stabilizers, okay? So advanced uh, VMO conditioning. So for the quadriceps, we're looking at conditioning the oblique portion of the vastus medialis, which is a portion of the quadricep that's responsible for knee tracking, for keeping the knee in alignment. And at the advanced level, what we're gonna do is a step down. So from here, I'm gonna step down like this and then come back up. Step down and come back up. This is very, very hard to do properly. Take note of a couple of things. Number one, as I go down, my heel comes up. As I come up, my heel goes down. So as I go down, my heel comes up. Look how high it's come up. As I go up, my heel goes down. This is the mistake people make with this. And then they lift their heel, and then they put their heel down, and then they step up. And that does two fifths of stuff all for you. You really need to make sure that you're getting the technique right. And that's the biggest insight for today. The biggest insight is that when people do these knee conditioning exercises, they don't understand the critical importance of these finer points. And when you get the points right, you get amazing muscle recruitment. It all happens the right way and you, you condition the joint the way that we want it to be conditioned. Get it wrong and what your body does is it does what's called a mechanical drop set where it just lets the knee and the hip go to wherever it wants and it just uses the muscles that are the strongest um, in your body. And that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to strengthen weak links. We're trying to make the weak links in your kinetic chain strong so that your knee is nice and stable and your injury resilient. So I'm gonna show you that one more time. So I'm gonna start like this, step forward, raise the heel as I go down. Now I'm standing on this foot, the left foot. As I come up, what I do is I transfer the weight into the ball of my foot, push down and stand up at the same time, okay? so. That's the first exercise. The second exercise that we're gonna, and you'll do um, three sets of 30 of those, okay? Now, if you're not injured and you just wanna condition your knee to be as strong as possible, these are, this whole routine is really, really good to do after you've done your squatting. So you can do your squatting with your barbell first um, and your hamstrings, so you're doing agonist and antagonist, and then you can do this whole routine as supplementaries. So now, 
going into some advanced hamstring conditioning, we're going to use the TRX here. So I'm going to put my heels in the TRX like this, okay? And then from here, I'm going to lay down so that my feet are hanging beneath the TRX. And then I'm going to push my bum in the air, pull in as hard as I can, and then out slowly. In hard and out slow. In hard and out slow slow and that is absolute murder on those hamstrings that is so much tougher than doing it with the football and you can even if you want to i mean this is really taking it up a notch you can put the trx through it sorry not like that like this put it through itself and oh you have to go oh, i haven't done this for so long oh that and then you put this one through there that's it okay and now I can put one leg in there and do a single leg one. That is really, really hard. So if you want to make it really challenging for yourself, do that. So just remember the one TRX goes through and then the other TRX goes through that one and that makes a solid platform for you to do your, hams your single leg hamstring curls off. Okay, now we move on to, and for that one you're only going to be doing um, between five and nine repetitions. So as long as you get five reps, and um, if you can do more than nine, you need to make it harder. And the ways you make it harder is pause for a second when your heels are against your bum and go out slower. That's the first way to make it harder. And honestly, to be able to do nine reps like that, where you pull in hard with your hips up in the air, pause for a second and then go out really slowly. If you can do nine of those, you're doing very, very well. So, uh, and then the other way to make it harder would be to go to one leg. So now the second uh, or the third exercise, the, the second pairing is going to be um, single leg good morning. So in the last one, we did single leg squats. So where I was uh, bending at the knee and the hip. Now we're going to do a single leg good morning, which means I keep the uh, knee on the leg that's bending completely straight. So all the way forward and all the way back up. This is very, very hard for people that haven't done it before. Okay, there's a lot of stabilization that goes on here. And what you're doing, by removing the bend in the knee, you make it much harder to balance. As soon as you, when you're bending your knee, you're bringing more joints into the movement, which makes it much easier to stabilize. So when you keep the knee straight, you're really relying on just the hip joint to create the movement much, much harder. Three sets of 20 repetitions of that one should do it for you. And last but not least, we're gonna do some really funky and very cool calf conditioning. So this is for the calf and for the, uh, uh, the ankle stabilizers. So what we're gonna do is single leg skipping. Now there's a couple of things I want you to look for. As best as I can, I'm gonna try and keep my knee straight and not let my heel touch the ground as best as I can, okay? Okay, so what I'm aiming to do is keep my heel up so I'm bouncing like that and keep the knees straight so I'm really isolating the movement into the calves, okay? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to aim for between 50 and 75 repetitions. Um, if you can't, and if you do five and then you stuff it up, you just keep going and try to get up to 50. I remember when I started, it was murder for me to even to do 35 or 40, but of course you'll progress. And then what you do is you put the skipping rope down and immediately go to a one foot stand with your eyes closed. So my eyes are closed and I'm standing on one leg and you can see immediately it's hard for me to keep my balance because what I'm doing now is, so what I'm doing, I'm gripping the floor with my toes and I'm just trying to stand up straight. Okay, there we go. I'm starting to get it a little bit more now. But you use the horizon so much for balance. Balance is a combination of your eyes seeing the horizon, your inner ear, and also proprioception, which is um, a part of the nervous system where when your body feels that you're falling this way, it sends a signal up to the brain to tense the muscles that would correct you and pull you back into, ba into alignment. And that's going on constantly when you're moving around. So what happens is we actually rely on the horizon for the majority of our balance. That's the biggest part in our balance. So 
When you remove that, when you close your eyes, you're only relying on your inner ear and the proprioception. And the burn that you'll feel in your foot and down in your ankles and in your calves is amazing. It's really, really good. So that's, uh, that's the routine. It's pretty simple. And um, let's get back into the uh, room now. Now, if you've just tuned in, um, please hit the like button. Let me know where you're watching from. Tell me your name and where you're watching from. And put any questions that you have. Any questions at all about knee conditioning or anything really, but you know, especially knee conditioning, so that I can answer them for you. Now, this is where, um, this is the biggest, I want to talk about the biggest mistake that people make. So the biggest mistake that people make when they're doing knee conditioning is they don't understand how to do these basic exercises correctly, like the way that your hips turn, the, the angle that your foot's at, if your knee tracks in a little bit. And I, gi I give the instructions very, very clearly, and it's up to you to really understand how to follow them properly. Now, what people do is, like what I talked about with the shoulder conditioning series, when people can't do the movements properly, they think, oh, I can't feel it, I'm going to add more weight. If I add more weight, I'll be able to feel it. And then they add enough weight and of course eventually they can feel it. But you've done that mechanical drop set that I'm talking about where you're not holding your hips in the right position, you're not engaging your core, you're not, um, the knee is not tracking in the direction that it should be and that completely changes the way that you're using the muscles and prevents you from creating the right conditioning. So if you can't feel it, with body weight, with the way that I'm demonstrating it, what you need to do is more of it to learn the movement pattern properly. And you need to film yourself from side on, from front on, from behind, and you need to have a look to see where your knee's tracking, where your hips are tracking, all of these different things, so that you make sure that you're doing it the right way. And it takes time. Honestly, we see people come in here, um, probably, uh, I reckon four out of five people at least, that come to Unity Gym, that um, everybody does this knee conditioning at the start of their journey. We, we do knee, con knee, hip and ankle conditioning for many weeks um, in the UMS program, same with our online coaching before people do uh, back squats or front squats with a barbell. And we do that because it's proven to cause, to um, create the least amount of injuries for our members, for our tribe. So, and so many people come in and they really can't follow these most basic cues for how to do it properly. So that's your biggest insight and the biggest mistakes that people make. Make sure you pay attention to that. So let's have a look at uh, the questions that I've got here. If you've just tuned in, um, uh, write your name in the comment there and where you're watching from so I can give you a shout out. Hit the like button, please. It means a lot to us. And any questions that you have that you want me to answer, put them in the, the comment box now. So Karina, welcome to the show again. Thank you for tuning in. Um, and to all of our regular viewers, I'm sorry about the disconjointed way that we've been doing our show this week. It's just because we're really trying to nail these um, last renovations that we're doing to get our gym uh, to where we want it to be. And uh, we've also got an amazing physiotherapist and sports massage um, master starting his own room um, in our gym, which is what Yanni and, and Phil, who's who's uh, our new physiotherapist is going to be doing. So, which is going to be really cool for you guys because we're going to have an unbelievable physiotherapist coming on this show whenever we want to to answer your questions. It's going to be really, really good. So, Karina's saying, I tried a type of hamstring curl using sliders on the ground this week. I use my elbows to support my hip raising. Is this not a good exercise? Um, it is and it isn't. We use that one. We, we, uh, we do that hamstring curl um, in our UMS program, but we more so do it not because it's better than any of the other curls, more because it just gives you another tool in the toolbox and it gives you a way to do things when you don't have access to other gym equipment. So you definitely can do it. Um, it just doesn't provide the same constant resistance that you get from the fit ball, like what I showed you on Monday and Tuesday's show and from those uh, from the TRX that I showed you or and definitely not from a, um, a, a, a prone hamstring curl machine or a seated hamstring curl machine or anything like that. But it, it is a it is a viable option. And if it's the best you can do, um, if you don't have access to any other equipment, then it's absolutely better than uh, nothing else. Um, so I hope that helps, Karina. Um, Ro uh, Bob is uh, saying, how do you know when you are ready to move from one uh, hardness level, we call it difficulty uh, or progression level, Bob, um, to the next. For example, to switch up from rehab level to advanced level, what do you look for or feel for in your work? So um, there's no hard and fastened rule for this. 
the more experienced you are with training, the quicker you can move to the next level. Um, for, there's a couple of things you want to look for as being a beginner or even what we call a trained beginner, which is somebody that's still on beginner progressions as far as we're concerned, but who has been doing a bit of training you know, themselves in the past and then an absolute beginner. And what we look for is that you, um, you, you can at least do the movement pattern properly. So if you watch these videos from Monday and Tuesday where I talk about, let's say Monday, the beginner variation of this where you're doing the side step up, where your toes are turned to a 15 degree angle and I talk about the knee not traveling inward. If that knee is traveling inward still, then I would not be looking at progressing to the, next, uh, to the next variation. I'd be really making sure that you nail the basics of the movement first. Um, and beyond that, you really wouldn't want to be doing the same thing for more than about eight or 10 weeks. Like that'd be a really long time to be doing the same thing. We prefer um, between, for beginners, for these conditioning routines between three and six weeks, but it depends on the person. But I would definitely be changing it up um, after eight to 10 weeks, um, irrespective, um, unless you're a real special case where there's some really crazy things going on in your body and we'd, we'd have to assess that by a case by case basis. Um, the other thing that you'd be looking for if you're doing conditioning, so if you're actually, sorry, rehabilitation, if you're rehabilitating an injury, you wanna make sure that when you go to a new progression and you experience um, you know, a four out of 10 with pain or less, you wanna start feeling that that pain starts to subside and it should start to subside within a week. And as long as you're not still experiencing the same level of pain when you do those exercises, as long as you feel that you've gotten better and you're not experiencing that pain, you know, in the joint that you're, or the muscle that you're trying to rehabilitate, then you can look at starting to move on to the next progressions. But a general rule of thumb, um, if you don't have any major injuries, uh, you're looking at between three and six weeks for each um, phase before you progress. Hope that helps, Bob. Um, Karina, second question. Uh, what can be the cause of an ongoing click in the knee with associated discomfort, which I've experienced for as long as I can remember? Karina, I'm just going to answer that in a sec because I can see we've got a whole bunch of new viewers that have just jumped on. For all of our new viewers, um, please let me know where you're watching from and what your name is so that I can give you a shout out and hit the like button for us. It means so much. And also put your questions in the comment there so I can uh, answer them for you. Any questions that you have about knee rehab or, or anything else that I can help you with. So. Uh, what could be the cause of an ongoing click in the knee? I need more information than that. And I have to be honest, um, Karina, when you start asking questions like this, I, um, uh, I have to say that I'm not a physiotherapist and I am not qualified to diagnose injury. So what I can do is I can give you my experience with the injuries that I've had and with the injuries that I've helped people um, rehabilitate and I've done a lot um, but it's it, it's the more common injuries so the first thing I'd ask is of course pain can you tell me um, in the comments there does the clicking cause you pain is it um, on the anterior or posterior so front or back of the knee or medial or lateral side so inside being medial lateral being outside of the knee or is it deep within the knee um, and uh, how, where does the clicking happen? Does it happen when you go down through, uh, through knee flexion or when you come up into knee extension? So as you're going down into a squat um, or as you're coming up. So you're saying um, regarding the 60s. Oh, so you've asked me another question. So yeah, you need, you, you're gonna need to answer those questions for me, Karina, for me to be able to answer your question properly. And I'm going to say, in all honesty, with something like this, you need to see a um, physiotherapist about it, someone like Phil. Um, I would definitely not like to step that far outside of my scope of practice and try and diagnose um, a knee injury that you have over a show like this. So Bob is saying, I have a similar follow-up to Karina's question. I notice a similar click or snap in my knee and it happens when I move uh, my knee in one diagonal direction, but not another. So look, those things are usually, have are both of you guys, can you put in the comments, have you had um, traumatic uh, injuries to your knee in the past? Most of the time when people say things like this, they've had an injury um, from years ago. People talk about, oh yeah, you know, I fell out of a car of a moving vehicle 20 years ago. Bang, there you go. That's why you're getting this problem. And so what happens is, 
you can get calcification in the joints, so um, uh, you can get calcium deposits to build up in the joint and cause um, problems like that. You can also get, it can just be the way that the synovial fluid causes the joint to move after you've had an injury and the way that, um, you know, the, the cartilage uh, moves against itself and uh, um, things like that. You can also get um, muscle adhesions where muscles, um, the, the, where the fascia is meant to slide over itself properly and even where the fascia is meant to slide over other connective tissue, it, um, uh, it can become fused together. It's called muscle adhesions, which is what uh, a lot of massage works to break up. Um, and that can cause clicking sensations. So there's a lot of things that can cause that stuff. Just as we were moving, just, just as I was talking, I moved my foot and it went click. You know, I get clicks through my joints all the time. Um, if it's not causing you pain, I wouldn't worry about it. But if it causes you pain, I would be uh, going to see a professional and, and seeing what they've got to say. Um, B-boy Lil Power is saying, hello, I am 20 years old. Can I learn the middle splits? If you're 20 years old, bro, I would say that there is a very high chance that you can learn the middle splits unless you have um, a genetic disorder that would be preventing you um, in your hips, which is very, very rare. Um, 20 years is a prime, prime age to be able to learn the middle splits. You just need to understand how to train for it properly. And we've got some great programs for that. And if you're not willing to purchase a program, um, scour through our YouTube channel because we have a ton of free tutorials on our YouTube channel to help you get the middle splits. So um, hope that helps, bro. Um, Bill in uh, Alberta, Canada. Thanks for tuning in, bro. Um, is this your first time? I haven't seen you um, pop up on our, uh, on our feed before. Is this your first time watching our live show? So Karina's saying, regarding the 60 second break between the exercises or sets of any mobility program, are you doing strength sets rather than resting or how do you use that time as active time? I haven't started the first phase. So when we do, you're talking, she's talking about, the, for those of you that uh, don't know, she's talking about the first phase of our UMS program. So we have, um, the way that we do our UMS, our unified movement system, is that we do strength training and then the, the recovery between the strength training sets is where we do our flexibility training. So rather than I'm flipping it on the head for what you've said, you've said during the rest between mobility, do you do strength training? Um, we, we call it the other way because you, you do strength training and you have a rest period that you need for the muscles to recover. And during that time, we do flexibility training. So the way that we do it in the UMS is that when we're doing upper body strength training, we do lower body flexibility training. And when we do lower body strength training, we do upper body flexibility training. The difference between flexibility and mobility is that flexibility is um, a series of exercises and sets and reps that are done with the intention to increase your, the flexibility of your muscles to give you increased mobility. That sounds confusing, but go with me. Whereas mobility training is anything, it's an umbrella term for anything that takes your joints through full range of motion. So flexibility is done to increase mobility. Mobility training is done to maintain your active range of motion, also for warm ups or for cool downs. Okay, so that's the difference there. Um, so Bob is saying, yes, car accident 30 years ago. I hear and feel a click, but no pain. Uh, there it is, brother. You've had an accident. You've got a clicky knee. Um, man, I've got a clicky hip. I've got a clicky shoulder. I've got a bung back. My ankles click. My wrist click when I warm up. Um, I've had so many injuries. I bashed myself up so bad when I was younger. But um, only the really bad injuries that are recent uh, cause me pain. Everything else is fine. It's just noise and yeah, you know, it affects your training. And what can you do? You just keep training. You do the best you can. Um, follow all of the standard guidelines. You know, don't push yourself to the point of pain. Um, work within your limits. Use progressive overload, which means that you you know, only gradually push the, uh, the limits of what you can do. Do that for several weeks. As I said, our preference, six weeks, and then gradually increase the difficulty or the complexity of the exercise and just keep working like that. And um, hopefully it won't cause you any pain and you'll be able to still see great results. Karina's saying, uh, I don't remember any knee injury. It's as I bend my knees causing discomfort but I can see a physio. I'm not asking for a diagnosis, just gathering info clues. Yeah, look, I think I've just um, given you all the info and clues as to what I think things like that are. If you're gonna see a physio, 
Phil is going to be ready to rock and roll next week, I think, and I highly recommend that you come and see him make the effort, Karina. Um, I know you're about 45 minutes away, you're telling us. It'll be well worth it if you want to get, because, you know, there's advice and there's the best advice, and you want to get the best advice, and I'm telling you that Phil is on another level. He's amazing. He's the guy that I go to to ask the same kind of questions that you're asking me. When I don't know something, I go to Phil and say, hey, Phil, how does this joint work? How does that joint work? He's amazing. Um... Bill, yep, first time. Awesome, man. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Hope you're enjoying it. If you've got any questions for me, uh, put them in the comments box. And that goes for all of you because I'm getting to the end of these questions. Um, so if I don't have any more soon, uh, we'll be ending the show. And if you've just tuned in, please hit the like button, uh, leave a comment, let me know where you're watching from and what your name is so I can give you a shout out. Uh, Robert uh, Burwell from the USA. Thanks for tuning in again, bro. Um, Robert is asking, which do you and Yanni prefer, high bar or low bar squats, and what is the knee position for each? Thank you. Um, I prefer high bar squats, but that's only because I haven't explored low bar squatting that much. But I can tell you what I know about it. I haven't done much low bar squatting. Um, but my friend, uh, Sebastian Oreb, who on Instagram is Australian strength coach, one of the best power lifters in the world and the strength coach to Thor Bjornsson. You might know him as the mountain in uh, Game of Thrones, uh, among many, many others. That's just one notable uh, client of his. Um, he does a lot of low bar squatting and it's a technique that they use in um, powerlifting. Now, everything that I'm about to say is to my best knowledge. Don't take this to the bank, okay? But to my knowledge, the reason why they do low bar squatting is you actually only lower the bar two inches on your upper back. So it goes from, basically the weight goes from your traps, your upper traps, to the posterior deltoid. That's all that shifts. You shift from the, the bar being on the upper traps, you shift it down a bit, and because you pull back enough with your elbows, the posterior deltoid takes the weight. And what it does is it changes your center of gravity, causes you to lean forward a little bit more, which makes the squat more glute dominant, which means you use your glutes more. As far as foot position goes, you have to widen the feet a little bit more to make room for your gut and your torso because you lean forward more, you need more room between the legs. What it also does is when you widen the feet a little bit and you... Um, uh, by leaning forward more, so you make you make it more glute dominant. The glutes are a strong. Well, the whole posterior chain. It's more posterior chain dominant, and the posterior chain is a whole group of muscles, um, mostly the glutes, hamstrings, and adductors. Um, whereas, uh, which control the hips, the hip extension in a squat. Whereas for knee extension, you've only got one group of muscles, which is quadriceps. So when you rely more on the posterior chain. For a lot of people, they can lift a little bit more with that. And when you widen your feet a bit, it means you don't have to go down and up as far to do your full squat. Like the bar doesn't travel as far down and as far up. So it's a more efficient way of squatting for competition, for something like powerlifting. So it's the favored position that powerlifters do in competition. Um, to my knowledge and from what I've seen, I've never seen a powerlifter do a high bar squat in a competition because it's not as efficient. They can't squat as much. So um, hope that helps, hope that answers your question. If anyone else has any last minute questions, please sing out. What we're gonna do tomorrow is we're gonna take this out of the advanced conditioning and we're gonna start to move into how you go from the conditioning out into full on strengthening for your knee. So look out for that. There's gonna be some really good stuff in tomorrow's episode. Besides that, thanks everyone for tuning in. It was great to have you all here and uh, I will see you tomorrow. Health is about performance, not just body image. You better be willing to accept what you're gonna have to do to get there. We'll start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. When you nail that skill, it's there forever. The body image goal doesn't get you that far. It's the consistency and frequency that's gonna get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcuts to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. It's the gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image.